Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome and thank you for joining the Adidas AG Q1 2020 conference call. Throughout today's recorded presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. The presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, you may press star followed by one on your touchtone telephone. Please press the star key followed by zero for operator assistance. I would now like to turn the call over to Sebastian Stefan, Senior Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thanks very much, Stuart, and good afternoon or good morning to those of you joining us from the U.S., and welcome to our first quarter 2020 results conference call. First of all, I hope you and your families are well. Our presenters during today's call will be our CEO, Kasper Rostet, and our CFO, Harmo Meyer. As always, we will kick it off in a second with the prepared remarks from Kasper and Harm, followed by the Q&A session. And during the Q&A session, as always, I would like to ask you to limit your questions to two in order to give as many people as possible the chance to ask their questions. And now, over to you, Kasper. Thank you very much, and welcome also from my side. Today, first, we'll give you a high level on both short and long-term aspects of our business, then a brief update on the business and the financials in the first quarter, then a deep dive into how we operationally address challenges and opportunities, and finally, current trading and the outlook. We are indeed living in unprecedented times, not only around the globe, but also for sport and for editors. Globally, 185 countries, which is 93% of all countries in the globe, have confirmed cases of corona, and the remaining seven have not present, does mean they don't have. Currently, there are no sporting events. All sporting events canceled or have been postponed. Major you know, events like Euro, the Olympics, or you know, tournaments in the different countries, local runs, are all put on hold at this stage. And 60% of our business, uh, our business is at standstill since uh, mid-March, so that means 60% of our business is completely closed. Stores are only open in a few countries, and more than 70% of our global stores are still closed. The only consistent store that's open 24 by 7 and is more important than ever is, of course, editors.com or rebot.com. During this crisis, our first and foremost priority has been the you know, security and health of our employees. What we've done is we've shut down most offices as you know precautionary measure to protect our employees. That means that more than 40,000 people are today are working from home in flexible work environment. And I have to say that we're very proud to see our employees are coming together to support each other, our business and our communities, and working in a digital setup that probably two or three years ago none of us would have believed to be you know viable. Secondly, is to ensure you know, the financial viability for our employees and remain committed to, you know, protecting them and their families. Uh, and, of course, we know that not only financially but also uh, uh, exposure-wise, particularly our retail staff, has been more exposed than the rest. And our TC staff that's currently working, whom we're very proud of. And secondly, ensuring that our supply chain continues to stay up. You know, many of our partners have been around for more than 10 years, actually 85% of our partners, and we have a deep responsibility for the extended supply chain to ensure that they will be around when the crisis go, you know, go, uh, go away. And we'll speak more about what we're doing to make certain that uh, this important partner and important chain of our value chain will remain up. At the same time, we want to support the global community, whether that be with safety equipments where we're working with carbon in the U.S. Uh, to produce face masks or local manufacturing in the different countries, which we're doing as we speak. We've made uh, financial donations to the WHO Solidarity Response Fund, to the China Youth Development Fund, and other initiatives. And in our ECOM, we give a two-dollar or two-year donation to the WSA Solidarity Response Fund for every ECOM purchase above 20 euros. And then uh, we've ensured that people work out from home by giving them access to a premium premium uh, part of our Runtastic app and hundreds of thousands of athletes using our videos to make certain that they train and stay fit from home. This is a very important part because a big part of the global population today are quote-unquote locked up in apartments or houses and are not allowed to get out, and their well-being being is important for us moving forward. When I look upon how we've been, how we've been running the company for the past six weeks, it's really been divided into three groups. 
increased flows, reduced outflows, and an additional financing, meaning we went from a P&L to a balance sheet because that was what, what was required. We changed the way we did this mid-March. Basically, we had the following priorities. More aggressively, push e and reallocate resources to e -com. Secondly, doubling down on recovery in China and Korea and where opportunities come. And number three, of course, I didn't, you know, intensify collections wherever possible. When, uh, when we look upon the reduced outflows, it was correct to adjust uh, order book and use flexible cost base without jeopardizing future, future prospects. We'll give you more de details later. And of course, all, also on the CapEx side, basically stop retail expansion, remodeling, and new IT projects and reallocate uh, resources from IT to our digital setup. And then, of course, look upon the underlying financing. Uh, what we have done is we believe that financial flexibility is key. The majority of businesses are closed and uncertain when they will change. And what we have done is we have tapped into existing credit facilities and repatriated cash from uh, foreign subsidiaries. We have access now to additional $3 billion of cash through the KFW syndicated loan, which we'll use to bridge this unprecedented uh, situation. Han will speak to you more through this in detail. And in this context, we'd like to thank the German government for its fast and comprehensive course of action in response to this uh, global financial crisis. Global crisis. What are the long-term implications for the industry? And here I'd like just to pause a second, just you know, because I think it's important that we get the long term uh, very clear ahead of us. We believe that health and sport will become even more important to the consumers moving forward. I believe very few people globally have not thought about their own health almost on a daily basis in the last six to eight weeks. So, you know, the move towards a more health and exercise oriented global population has been accelerated through Corona. Maybe not in the short term, but definitely in the medium term and in the long term. The global brands and brand strength more, matters more than ever and behaving appropriately and also being present and engaging with the consumer throughout the crisis is extremely important. And thirdly is we're seeing a fast forwarding of the digital transformation. Since 2016, digital has been our agenda as a digital cornerstone, but there's no doubt that the acceleration we're seeing right now towards a more digital and DDC-led company is getting a huge step forward compared to a normal setup. So there are long-term implications for the industry where several of them are very, very positive. That does not preclude that we have significant challenges in the short term, but the medium long term remains or has increased in the positive outlook. Now let me take you through the business update. We continue to leverage multiple dimensions of innovation, and that means launching new products or new campaigns. Our home team campaign has been our biggest campaign ever in the history of Adidas, where we're using 60% of our global assets in uh, promoting our brand and engaging with consumers, where we have new campaigns within the framework coming up every single day. It has been a new way of engaging with the consumer, and a way that what we see forward will be an extremely effective way. And as you can see, it has been our most effective campaign ever. At the same time, products also continue to sell. Our superstar, which celebrates its 50 years anniversary, was up 20% in the first quarter, despite the 20% down for the company. Our Predator football boot was up 30% in the first quarter. And not to forget, while it's a while ago, the launch of the Beyonce Ivy Park collection in January was instantly sold out and continues to have an extremely high buzz. It means that we have one of the most exciting females related to the entertainment industry related, you know, working with Adidas, and we're very excited with the future launches that are coming. So while we speak about a quarter in great crisis, we have been able to see a number of successful product launches, story launches, and also new collaborations. When I look upon the strengths and weaknesses, we were actually off to a good start before the coronavirus stuck. After the first two months, we we're running at an 8% growth, excluding APAC. So very similar to what we've seen in the past or on the higher end. Um, we also uh, have immediately put a number of effective actions in place to keep our people safe. As I said, 40,000 people are working from home, and we've had a very high, low exposure to the coronavirus within the Adidas family. We've done an extremely fast shift of resources towards digital, not only product and uh, money resources, but also people resources from within our organization, where we've taken traditional IT resources and allocated them to speed up our development of our digital platforms. 
and we've built sufficient financial flexibility within our company. Of course, there are also things that gave us you know, a lot of challenges. The rapid you know, global breakout of the outbreak of the coronavirus and the speed, and it hit particularly in the beginning of March with Europe, U.S., and Latin America being impacted within three days. Uh, the head went from the exposure we have to greater China, which will in the longer term be positive for us. But of course, with a 23% share of our business coming from China, we were very much exposed in the first quarter. The elevated inventory levels that are coming out of this, not only for us or the sporting goods industry, for, for the globe as such, if, if the globe you know, closes down for six weeks, not having uh, elevated inventory levels would be, uh, I would say, a misjudgment. And we'll continue to be able to deal with that or have to deal with them uh, moving forward. And then, of course, from a number of standpoint, material decline in our profitability for the first quarter down more than 90%. And this brings me to the P&L of the glands. Revenue decreases 90, 19% in currency neutral and also nominal to 4.753 billion. The gross margin down 420 basis points to 49.3. Due to declines in most markets, the operating margin down 13 and a half you know, basis, you know, percentage points down to 1.4. And net income from continued operation down 97% to 20 million. And, and basic EPS down a bit less, 96 to 13 cents per share. If you look upon the strategic growth areas, North America grew 1% but had double digit growth into the end of February. Then we had the store closures. Uh, Greater China down 58%, and particularly around the Chinese New Year and end of February heavily impacted. We're seeing a recovery starting to materialize in March, which we'll speak about later in this presentation. And our income up 35% uh, for the full quarter, up 55% in March, and up a triple digit in the beginning of April. So we are clearly seeing a you know, huge migration toward, business migration towards, towards e-com. From a brand standpoint, the Adidas <coughs> brand was down 20%, and the Reebok brand was down 12%. The reason why the Reebok brand was down less than the Adidas brand was the relative lesser exposure overall to Asia compared to Adidas, that picture will, of course, change moving forward. But I would still say we still have very, very strong product launches, whether it was Superstar, Yeezy, Beyonce, and even Adilet, which I'll get to later. But with this, I'd like to hand over to Ham, who will take you through the financials in more detail. Ham, please. Thank you, Kasper. Let's start with the development of our market segments. <coughs> A look at our regions on the world map illustrates how the coronavirus and its negative impact on our business model actually moved from east to west. Asia Pacific was impacted first and most severely in Q1 with revenues down 45%, mainly driven by a sales decline of 800 million or 58% in Greater China. This includes the takebacks in a triple digit million euro amount to manage inventory levels in the market. While stores in Greater China and South Korea reopened during March, closures came into effect in most other parts of the world. Up until this point, we had a good start to the year with 8% growth by the end of February, excluding APEC. Europe was up in the mid-single digits, while most other regions posted double-digit growth in the first two months. Closures, hence significantly weighing on the first quarter sales developments in emerging markets, with minus 11%, in Europe minus 8%, Latin America flat, North America plus 1%, and to a lesser extent in Russia, CIS plus 9%. Declines in regional operating margins correspond to the revenue shortfalls, reflecting the operating deal leverage. When we take a closer look to the P&L uh, in Q1, because we mentioned already the 90% decline on the net sales, uh, both in current neutral and nominal. So if you go a little deeper in gross margin, a decline of 420 basis points to 49.3%. Driven by less favorable regional mix due to the overproportionate sales decline in Greater China and negative FX developments given the strong dollar. In addition, we recorded cost in a high double-digit million euro amount related to the cancellation of purchase orders from suppliers in Asia to adjust the inbound flow of inventories to the current circumstances. This alone accounted for almost two percentage points of the gross margin decline. Operating expenses, minus 1%, and as a percentage of sales, plus 9.1 percentage points, starting with the marketing investment. Marketing remained stable as we executed the majority of our consumer marketing and product activation efforts in full 
during the first two months of the year and accelerated investments to support e-commerce. Operating overheads decreased 1%, including the impact of higher bad debt allowances. More details on our approach to cost flexibility I will give you later on. Operating profit declined 93% to $65 million, and the decline reflects operating deleverage due to the revenue shortfall. This includes a combined negative impact of around $250 million from the product takebacks in Greater China, the cancellation of purchase orders, and the increase in bad debt allowance. And again, the takebacks amount to a triple-digit million amount. The cancellation of purchase orders and the penalties uh, associated with that is a high double-digit number. And again, we accepted this hit in the P&L in Q1 to prepare for a healthier second half. On the net debt and equity position, the net debt amounted to $570 million at quarter end. This represents a deterioration of more than $1.4 billion compared to the net cash position of $873 million at year end. The net debt position still is modest in historical context. You see 2016 and 2017 was closer to $1 billion. More detail on the liquidity developments and measures later on, and the equity ratio remains solid at over 32%. Now on the development of the operating working capital. Only moderate increase in average operating working capital to 19.4% as a percentage of sales. Inventories were actually up 36% currency neutral due to the inevitably lower than expected product sell-through caused by the broad-based store closures and consequently lower shipments to our retail stores or to our wholesale accounts. Receivables down 5% currency neutral, partly driven by lower shipments to its quarter end. Payables were up 25% currency neutral, also reflecting measures to manage our cash outflows. Now I would like to give you some more details on the priorities that we set as a management team in these unprecedented times. With our current priorities, we are striking the balance between short-term challenges and long-term opportunities. Health and safety of our people and community, of course, remains a top priority. Four of our further priorities to be covered in this section. The operational flexibility, so we have plans in place to manage our inventories and our cost. The financial flexibility, we explain the decisive measures we have taken and to the access to additional liquidity. The digital opportunities, e-com, more important than ever before, and the learnings from China, the first major markets on the road to recovery. I'm going to discuss our operational and financial flexibility. Casper then is going to cover digital and China. Adjusting our cost base to protect cash and profits, given our lower top line, is the number one priority. Of course, we are doing that case by case in order to not jeopardize our future prospects. When we go into the details um, of our cost, I would like to decompose it a little bit based on the you know, fiscal year 2019 and what our flexibility is in 2020. And of course, again, the cost for focus on tactical measures to not jeopardize our future prospects. When I look at the operating overheads, which is more than two-thirds of our you know, cost base, you know, personal expenses are largely fixed. We go through these unprecedented times with our 60,000 employees and remain committed to protecting their financial security. We execute on strict saving plans in logistics, travel and entertainment, IT projects, and anything that is discretionary and spent. We also have flexibility in e-commerce and DCs or warehouses but consider those areas to be critical for our store that is open 24-7, which is digital. On the marketing side, which is almost one-third of our cost base, we realize savings through variable endorsement contract components and the cancellation of physical events. We also remain committed to brand building sports marketing contract and campaigns. Kasper talked about the hashtag home team, which levels more than 50% of our global assets in the campaign. Different to Q1, where we had limited time to react to the rapid global spread of COVID-19 towards the end of the quarter, both operating overheads as well as marketing investments will be down year over year in Q2 in absolute terms. We also have a plan in place to arrive at a healthy and reasonable inventory level at year end. First, it's a proactive order management to align deliveries with, to its lower demand and repurpose and liquidate existing inventories to the course of the year. 
So the first chart that you're seeing here right now, and please understand that the bar chart that you're seeing here are illustrative by nature. So don't you know, calculate every bar chart. It's an illustration. And you see that we placed orders in the blue chart that will be delivered. We also you know, placed orders that we have actually postponed to later quarters or later months, and we actually canceled some orders proactively as well. And all the cancellations have been in close alignment with our suppliers. That's how we are managing the inflows of inventories through three distinct measures. And then, of course, we are optimizing the inventory flow through the full year as well, as we are starting with an elevated inventory level. And we are pulling several levers to deal with the existing inventories. First, there's Evergreen products that will be repurposed um, into 2020 products. And these are not just the you know, Stan Smiths and Superstars. There's a lot of products that will be as relevant in Spring Summer 21 as they are in 2020. The majority of remaining products will go to our own operated factory outlets. We have 1,100 you know, factory outlets globally, and we stopped ordering for these you know, outlets uh, to clear some of the inventory that has been built uh, or will be built in Q2. Ecom will also provide an opportunity to clear inventory through commercial moments and major online sales events throughout the year. The most prominent will be Cyber Week. Uh, it will be Singles Day or Doubles Day in China. And a smaller portion can also be moved through selective retail partners. However, I want to be very clear, we do expect a promotional environment as the closures affect the entire industry in the second half. Against that background, arriving at reasonable inventory levels at the end of the crisis is a clear priority for us. That is also reflected in operating working capital targets we have reintroduced for all markets, whether it's in inventories or receivables management. We have also taken some decisive measures uh, to ensure additional liquidity. The current situation poses a challenge even for healthy companies, in particular when it comes to liquidity. We have sufficient financial flexibility. We suspended the dividend and the share buyback. We reduced management compensation. We will use existing cash buffer and tapped into unused credit facilities. And access to the additional three billion syndicated loans through KFW and partner banks which we will use to bridge this unprecedented situation. Now I would like to show you some more details on the cash outflow in Q1 and the cash development in Q1. So let's take a closer look at the cash consumption first. As you can see on the left-hand side, it was primarily driven, the overall cash consumption of 1.4 billion was primarily driven by operating working capital of 1.1 billion. And then, of course, we had to share buyback and then keep investing in our company with CapEx. The outflow was limited by effective measures, roughly 300 million, to maximize cash inflows while minimizing also outflows. That's what you see on the right-hand side. The right-hand side also the place where we tapped into existing credit lines and other sources of funding, roughly 1.2 billion. As a result, we had a cash position of 2 billion at the end of March. 1.3 billion of that is directly accessible at the AG level, while 700 million is sitting in foreign subsidiaries. So what is our total accessible liquidity on a decomposed basis? As explained on the previous chart, we had $2 billion of cash at the end of March. We have already repatriated some cash from foreign subsidiaries, but there's still $700 million sitting in these subsidiaries that are not you know, readily available and only partially available to us. We now have also access to an additional $3 billion through the KFW syndicated loan. So $2.4 billion from KFW plus $600 million from our consortium our partner banks. Let me be very clear, this revolving loan comes at customary market conditions. It does not include any government subsidy or any equity position into Adidas. We will make use of this loan to cover our liquidity needs during the current crisis. We will pay back any used part of the loan, including interest and fees, as soon as the situation normalizes. As nobody knows when this will be, we can also not, pre we can also not predict reliable at this point in time to what degree we are going to make use of the credit facility, and when will it be uh, paid back. We aim to make use of other funding sources as they become available in order to substitute the syndicated loan. In sum, we have direct access to $4.3 billion of liquidity, which provides us with sufficient flexibility. With that, I would like to hand over to Kasper again. Thank you very much. So Ham spoke about the empowerment of the balance sheet. Let me now go back to the P&L. 
there is no doubt that the one store that is open in the world is Ecom, and we've been using that very strategically not only in the last six weeks, but basically since 2016. We originally had a target of approximately $4 billion for 2020. So despite the fact that we have a, you know, I would say, meltdown of the global trading environment, we've now raised the target to beyond $4 billion. And what we've done is we've reallocated resources across the organization, whether it's technical resources, marketing resources, or sales resources, to ensure that we accelerate the growth that we'd originally planned. We're driving brain awareness and digital sales through consumer-facing campaigns and well-received product launches. I spoke about a number of them today. And as I said, we're looking upon and using e as a mitigation to minimize the impact of the potential disruption. So while we're making great progress in this area, let me just one thought, you know, one um, moment of caution. Of course, we will not be able to subsidize the business we will be losing completely in our brick and mortar. But what we are doing, we're dramatically accelerating our e business and also for the long term, moving into a more D2C focused setup. <clears throat> and what we did was, as I said, we doubled down and raised our targets. We're prioritizing in our supply chain and reallocating inventory to e meaning that in the past we would have income, you know, inventory that was reserved for wholesale orders that has now been reallocated and, of course, making certain that our e business can get access to all of inventory. We're focusing product launches on our digital channel. We're shifting, as I said, marketing investments towards digital, so increasing our marketing spend. We're reallocating you know, people from the entire the organization to where it makes sense within our e com setup. And we're also having efforts to support growth in our digital partners business, so the wholesale business. And that means that not only the Solandos of this world, but JD, Foot Logger, et cetera, who all have digital channels that we continue to co collaborate with them and cooperate because part of our business is coming through that channel environment. That is not included in the numbers I'm speaking about up here. So a you know, strong, increased focus on our e-com business to make certain that in the short and the medium term, it will help the company. So we also you know, leverage our integrated digital ecosystem to drive brain awareness and sales. We do hype launches such as Yeezy or Beyonce or 4D. We engage consumers through free premium access to our running and training app because we know when people engage through our app, we have a higher conversion rate. And we're launching social media campaigns like Home Team Campaign, the most successful campaign we've ever done. And that means that the successful e growth we had as a priority from the, creating the new from the previous years will continue to move forward, and we believe we have built a proven re, uh, re, recipe for success in digital. When we look upon China and trying to take the first learnings out of China and understand how can we apply these learnings uh, to the road to recovery for other markets, we're looking upon and saying, seeing that retail business are recovering since stores opening at the beginning of March, but traffic and conversion trends are normalizing over time, but they're below normal rates. So even when traffic goes up, conversion still remains lower. We're seeing e-commerce business also impacted during February, but recovers much quicker, driven by aggressive you know, doubling down on digital channels. And we see the same in other markets when a market closes down. It also brings initially the digital channel down, and that then recovers after a couple of weeks. And we built a successful strategy to re revitalize retail after the end of uh, the confinement period, creating brand moments and campaigns to drive traffic and conversion. It's clear that when the stores have been empty for four, six, eight, or maybe 10 weeks and consumers have not been in the store, it takes a while to get people back into the store and convert. And we're taking all the learnings from China and building that into a recovery plan for the rest. And what we're giving you here is a chart which is indicative of what we have. The China D2C business, so the direct-to-consumer business, has shown a, you know, a rebound after the sharp decline in February. We're seeing sales growth in own stores turning positive at the beginning of April, however, mainly driven by commercial moments we created in our own stores, and that will continue across the board for the entire industry. We see sales through levels of franchise continue to below uh, prior year level, partly due to commercial uh, moments, but also partially due to locations. We're seeing traffic conversions in store normalizing gradually over time rather than instantly, so that means that the new normal is not, I go back and did this week what I did six weeks ago. It takes a while to come back to previous levels. As we said, e-commerce was also impacted but less and recovered earlier. And China e-com uh, accelerated to triple-digit growth in the first weeks of April. So let me just pause here and just repeat the e-com number. E-com was 35 for the quarter 
it was 55 for the month of March, and in China it's now triple digit in April. So you can see the rapid acceleration we're seeing in ecom. We're seeing similar chart and developments in our other regions, as you see on this chart, with the delay factor. So you're seeing relative you know, improvements in all markets as time goes by. So we're taking the proven setup from China on how to stay engaged with the consumers and restart business. And we believe we serve, we need to serve the consumers' needs in digital also during the lockdown, irrespective of whether a transaction will take place. That means we stay in touch with consumers and celebrate end of confinement period with them, try to make certain that they understand we're coming out of a closure. And we initiate commercial moments to drive traffic after, restrict, after restrictions were lifted. We're confident that 2020 will only be temporary dip in what is a long-term growth story in China. We've seen double-digit growth from 2015 to 19, and we're confident that China will re go back to previous growth levels. Now, let's come to the outlook. We focus so much, much on the coronavirus that sometimes we forget that we actually have a normal company to run, and our product engine continues to run now digitally. We have a record sales. Our yoga mats fit from home keeps our communities alive. The iconic Adilet growing triple digit in April as we activate our launchwear products. So people now start using the Adelaide as their home shoe. We're expanding the Ultra Boost franchise with new Prime uh, Blue recycled models. We have celebrated the 50 year anniversary and are celebrating of Superstar with a unique Pharrell collaboration. And as I said, we grew the business 20% in the first quarter despite the overall business being down by 20%. We see three years of 40 in May and continue to scale across categories and price points. And the Reebok Sick Connecticut continues strong performance in our DTC channels that we partner us. So what I'm saying is we continue to create products. We can continue to bring products into the market now just predominantly through the digital channels. When we look upon how do we get through this, we look upon it in three stages. Managing the storm, coming out of the storm, and managing the new normal. The managing the storm is partly what we spoke about before, is how do we get our balance sheet under control, generate cash flow that allows us to make the right decisions for the future and that contains the health and safety of our people, the right operational flexibility in our supply chain, ensuring that we have the financial flexibility to maneuver and going after our digital opportunities. Coming out of a storm is understand how the changing preferences and shopping behaviors impact our business in the future, and that's where digital and D2C helps us. The ramp up of locations when we can, and we're not only in control of that ourselves, of course, it's very much under government scrutiny, and I think what you're seeing in the weeks to come is going to be one of the most important moments is the opening up of Germany, which is the first major country outside Asia that is opening up, and you're seeing a slow sequential opening up of retail environments. And pending on the learnings from this, I'm certain that many countries will draw their own conclusions and make decisions, but of course, I'm certain impacted and also influenced by the learnings of Germany. Making certain that we have the right resource and inventory reallocation, so where do we have inventory, how do we spend it in the most appropriate way, and refocus on the long-term strategy execution. So we want to make certain that we're capable of taking the long-term right decisions for the company, investing in the right store the right place, or investing in the right sport asset, which is why the financing is so important for us, while at the same time being very prudent on the cost side. And coming out of the recession or out of the normal, understanding what is the impact of, do we have a global recession, and which kind of economic uncertainty will come we're certain that health and sport will be even more important moving forward. I spoke about before, and I'll reiterate here, we are very confident that the very positive position of sport will continue and will be enhanced, enhanced moving forward. Brand strength matters, and that's why we continue to invest in the brand, because it is going to be a consolidation around the big, and it has brought and will continue to bring a fast forward of the digital transformation for our industry, but also for our company. If you look upon the current situation, we are right now trading in an environment where 70% of our stores are closed or 80% are partially closed. So it's a very different trading environment that we've had. But at the same time, we are working on how does the world look beyond this position and engaging very deeply with local authorities to understand how we can open up. But this is the trading environment you've seen through April. That means that 70% of our stores have been completely closed, approximately 10% have been partially closed, all countries, more or less, with the exception of China and Korea, has been closed. The only global store is online. Our picture should not be any different to pretty much any other picture in the world, because what we're describing here is the legal, you know, the consequences 
of the legal decisions that the countries in the globe has taken. And of course, it has had a significant impact on our business. And that brings me then to the outlook for the second quarter. We expect revenues to be down by more than 40%. In Q3, only three countries were impacted for a prolonged period, China, Korea, and Japan. In Q2, China and Korea are recovering versus Q1. E-com is accelerating versus March, the 55%. But almost all other stores have been shut for the first month in Q2 and will most likely stay shut for a while. So we lost more than a billion already in April. Um, and obviously, Q2 sales will decline as we've seen the start, and it will be more outspoken than in the first quarter. So we expect a revenue decline in the second quarter of more than 40%. The Q2 operating losses in the triple digital million range, um, we have taken the flexibility in our cost base and are making use, of, use to make sure we protect cash and profits. Margin working budget and operating overheads are going to be done, in, you know, be down in absolute terms in the second quarter. At the same time, we also remain committed to protecting our employees' financial security. We need to make certain that we have a sound and well-functioning employee base that will allow us to start up when the startup happens. And that's why we need to make certain that we take the right decisions, not only from the employee base, but also making certain that we don't take any decisions that jeopardizes the future prospects of our business. And again, deal version could too, given the more pronounced top-line growth. So the outlook is based on the following assumption. Our current assumption is that we will be able to sequentially reopen stores throughout May and June and have a largely operational store base by the end of Q2. In Europe, we've already started to open selective stores. 20 are open and 20 more to come. In North America, we expect to start with the first reopening of the stores mid-May. However, there are still many uncertainties as we manage through 2020. The speed of recovery in China plus the risk of setbacks. The duration of store closures and openings in the rest of the world. The economy and consumer sentiment and excess inventories across all markets. That's why in the context of this, when we do not believe it's possible to provide an outlook for 2020 that includes the impact of the coronavirus, but we'll give you a quarterly uh, outlook as we speak. When it comes uh, to our strategy, we will hereby inform you that we will now present our strategy in March 2021 um, because we do not believe that we can present it in the right environment by the end of 2020. Uh, we see that the global economy is still very volatile and we want to make certain that we have found a position of a high level of stability, not only for the, for the global economy, but also for the company to ensure that we give you the right economic outlook for the next five-year circle. We believe that despite the challenges that we have seen, there is an opportunity to become a circular winner from this crisis based on what I said before. The move and acceleration towards a more healthy lifestyle, the increased focus on digital, and the consolidation around fewer and stronger brands. That brings me to the summary. We're focusing on navigating the company through this period of time which nobody has seen before. We're using our operational flexibility that is sufficient and also our financial flexibility. We're doubling down our digital channels and tools to ensure that we migrate our company faster towards a D2C setup. We're seeing the structural industry trends being amplified and accelerated, which in the medium term is an opportunity and a bigger and a positive for Adidas. And we believe enabling the long-term success by preparing for the new normal dealing with the current, but make certain that we are prepared for tomorrow, and we're doing both in parallel. With this, I'd like to thank you for your patience, and Ham and I now look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we will begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star followed by one on their touchtone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star followed by two. If you're using speaker equipment today, please lift the handset before making your selections. Anyone who has a question may press star followed by one at this time. One moment for the first question. The first question comes from the line of Graham Renwick from Berenberg. Please go ahead. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is safe and well. Um, just a few questions for me, please. Just firstly on gross margin, is it possible for you just to break out the components of that 420 basis point decline in Q1 in particular? What was the discounting 
element of that. And was there a, an inventory provision or increased inventory provisioning in Q1 COGS for future markdown, um, given the elevated inventory levels you have? And if so, how much? And then secondly, on e-commerce, um, just wanted to get an understanding of how much of that sharp increase in growth had been driven by sort of promotional activity versus underlying demand. And when we think about the new target for, for over 4 billion sales, um, is there going to be a lot of clearance within that that won't repeat next year? Or is that going to be a sustainable base that you can grow the, the e-commerce business off um, next year? I mean, ultimately, will you have a structurally higher share of e-commerce going into next year? Um, thank you. Yeah, Graham, starting with the 420 basis points on the gross margin, as I indicated earlier, of course, there's market mix and there's FX in there. Uh, there's limited, you know, you know, uh, promotional activities in there, just limited to to China. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, it came too late in you know end of March for other markets, so it was normalized as you saw. Um, and then the remainder is the PO cancellation, the penalties for that, where I said it's a high, you know, double digit amount. Um, of course, there's a, an inventory revision in there as well. But uh, as you know, based on our policies, uh, the inventory buildup that we have in Q1 is pretty much current inventory that we're having of spring summer 20. So it's only a limited amount of inventory revision in there. When it comes to your e-commerce question, we don't do the split out between uh, you know promotion and non-promotional driven revenue. You should assume, particularly in the latter part of the quarter, that more has been promotion. But just remind you that we did not see the close down of the three largest, or Europe, US, or Latin America before around the 15th, 16th. Um, from a clearing standpoint, of course, part of it is clearing, but Ham also very clearly said we have 1,100 factory outlets. Of course, they will, for next year, be the primary clearing house for us. So we need to find the right balance. I do believe that the foundation we're putting up will be a sustainable one because when consumers get used to shop online, frankly, they shop online with and without clearing. But we, we will be using, of course, also this year, our factory outlets as a permanent clearing channel. Right now, because they're not open, we force also to use decom. Over time, of course, that will migrate more and more to uh, to our factory outlets. No, that's great, thanks. Can I, can I just follow up? Is there, is there any sort of stats you can give on sort of the greater engagement you're seeing through digital channels? For example, you know, how many more people have signed up for your or, or downloaded the app in Q1? How many people have signed up to the Runtastic apps? Is there anything you can sort of give there, give us a sense of the greater engagement you're seeing there? No, we don't give those stats out, but of course you can assume there is a correlation between the revenue growth and the stats because uh, we are seeing a very strong revenue growth. Okay, great. Thank you very much. The next question comes from the line of Jeff Lowry from Redbird. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi team. Um, two comments, please. Um, firstly, can you help us understand what your approach is to inventory that sits with your channel partners outside China. Um, obviously, you took back a significant uh, element of inventory that was sitting out there in China. Um, can you help us with the strategy X china And secondly, just on gross margin, to understand the 200 basis points or so that you've taken for um, cancellation and adjustment to forward orders, does that get your full year by into line with where you want it to be? Or will some element of a charge for that recur across quarters two to four, please? Yeah, Jeff, probably stating, uh, starting with the gross margin, as you indicated on the PO cancellation, and you can assume that this is largely covering uh, what we had to adjust for the full year, assuming also the recovery in the second half, uh, you know, uh, through the net sales. So assume it's a hit that we took in Q1 to be at healthier levels in the second half, and, you know, based on our order windows, um, that's where we had the flexibility also towards the, the year end. So assume it's largely covered in the first quarter. Great. Secondly, on the inventory on the inventory approach, uh, we are not uh, exactly repeating what we did in China. In China, when we did the take back, there was an isolated event, you know, in China where we did it for China. And of course, uh, this will, as Casper mentioned, be cleared through the factory outlet network that we have in China that is also open in China as we speak. We will have a different approach in the, in the rest of the world um, where we have been, you know, better prepared now based on the learnings also from China. We are working with our account relentlessly. We are now adjusting the seasons where we are shifting, as I indicated in our bridge as well, we are shifting the season, you know, by four weeks or six weeks. We are planning more diligently what are the carryovers in spring, summer 21. So it's a much more strategic approach 
uh, relative to the tactical approach that we had in China. So do not assume that we have a similar approach for the rest of the world as we have seen for China in Q1 and with a respective impact on Q1 financials. That's great. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Piral Dariana from RBC. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. Um, afternoon, everyone. So if I could perhaps start on with North America, um, I believe that was the only region to see a significant gross margin gain of 280 basis points. Could you just help us understand what the drivers of that gain are? Was it channel FX or perhaps anything else? And equally in North America, I think OPEX increased by close to 30% in the quarter as well. So could you perhaps just help us understand uh, whether there's anything specific to, to, to call out there? Um, and secondly, just in terms of um, the 250 million one-off, could you perhaps just break out how much of that was in COGS and how much of that was in OPEX related to, you know, uh, product take backs, bad debt provisioning and forward cancellations? Thank you. Yeah, starting with uh, North America, of course, uh, the gross margin, indeed, you identify that is better than prior year. And again, you always, uh, you know, find the comparable quarter. As you remember, we had the capacity constraints last year in the U.S. Uh, we, have, we had some challenges to get the, the product in. That's why it's, uh, you know, positive in Q1 2020 relative to the negatives that we had uh, last year. Um, then you had the question on the operating overheads. Um, yes, it's also comparable to, to last year. Uh, where we had the additional supply chain, you know, cost and the the um, not it wasn't the air freight because that is in the margin, but there was the additional cost that we had to bring the product in, um, and we had additional operating overhead, um, uh, not just last year but also this year as well. On the one-offs, um, as I said, the PO cancellation is primarily in the gross margin, um, and there are some, of course, in the market mix you see it in the in the gross margin as well, and some of the takebacks uh, from China we will see in the gross margin. And then primarily what you see in the bad debt is on the operating overhead. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Elena Mariani from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Um, hi, good afternoon, and thanks very much for taking my questions. Um, my first one uh, is about uh, your performance versus peers. I'm talking about Western peers and also, um, you know, in, to a certain extent, Chinese peers. But I was curious to uh, understand how you explain the delta in performance versus your main competitors, um, uh, which seems to have posted or guided to a milder PNL impact from the virus. Is this because you're buying back more stock, so you're taking a larger hit initially, uh, while perhaps others will take a more gradual approach, uh, or is this because of a different distribution structure, mainly in China? Is there anything that we've been missing just because, particularly in China, even if you exclude the impact from your inventory buyback, the underlying performance seems to be poorer versus the other peers? Um, and then... The second question uh, is about the moving parts uh, of your uh, working capital. Um, could you comment on the relationship and the dialogue you've been having with your uh, suppliers and, and retailers? Um, I was looking at your Q1 moving parts, and um, I was curious to hear whether you've been given some extension in the payment terms um, by your suppliers, or maybe simply you're using the maximum headroom available. Uh, and same questions for the retailers. Which sort of flexibility are you giving them on payment terms? Um, and what have you been agreeing with them on the future um, selling and the level of discounting they will be able to uh, apply to unsold products? Thank you. So, Lena, let me start with the first question, and I will take the second question. Right now, there is no peers that are reporting in the same time period, and I think that's the most important part here. The, the coronavirus started around the 20th of January, and depending on which reporting cycle you have, you actually have different you know, closure dates. So the, to the best of my knowledge, I don't believe there's any of our peers that reported a first quarter that's identical to the calendar quarter. For me, that is uh, the most important one. So for us, I, I'm, I don't know where the comparisons are coming. The comparisons that we have, which is the only one we can have, is we've looked upon online trading on the Chinese trading platforms where we've actually been either number one or number two consistently in the last, I would say, eight weeks on online trading. 
the reported trading in the period, I do not believe, and maybe I'm wrong, but I have not seen any of our competitors coming out and reporting Q1 comparable numbers from a timing standpoint to us. So that's why I can't comment on it, because I simply, I don't believe anybody has done it. Yeah, and the second question on the operating working capital, uh, indeed, first and foremost, we worked with all our suppliers to make sure that we're that we're going through it as partners. So, of course, we, we, we reviewed uh, the, the payment terms. We also reviewed the utilization of our suppliers, and everything was in good collaboration with our suppliers that we stay healthy on, um, on, on both sides. Then, of course, uh, beyond the trade suppliers, we have non-trade uh, you know, procurement as well. Uh, where we rather talk about the IT projects or other, you know, discretionary spend that we have, where we extended our payment terms, and you saw, and you saw part of that in the pay bills. Um, when it comes to the to the retailers, it's a market by market, account to account uh, approach. And as I said, we are not repeating what we did in China with the product takebacks. We have a different approach in other markets, and depending on the account, uh, there are different strategies to it that our sales team are executing, depending on when it's opening, depending on what the inventory levels are, depending on what the you know, overdue of the um, receivables are. But as you mentioned earlier, we are, we are definitely very uh, diligent on our collection side as well, but it's a give-get scenario, account by account and market by market. Great, thank you. Maybe just one small follow-up. So is it fair to say that in China you're practically done everything, you've bought back as much as possible, so you're ready to uh, restart, um, uh, you know, with uh, with some new fresh selling, while perhaps uh, in other markets it's going to take uh, more time uh, for the inventory to be cleaned up given that you cannot use uh, that, um, you know, one-time approach? That would be a correct assumption, but the one caveat you should have is, of course, is a China is a Chinese inventory matching the sellout, and we expect China to be back to previous level by the end of this quarter. So the end of the quarter, you're reaching, you know, the right, uh, you know, the same trading level. So of course, that assumes that that you know forecast is correct. Right now, that is the indication that we have when we look upon the daily trading increase in China, online and offline. But of course, that's an assumption that we're having right now. All assumptions are volatile. Understood. Thank you very much for all the clarifications. Thanks. Next question is from the line of Jurgen Kolb from Kepler Chevrolet. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, two questions. First of all, um, on the CapEx line for this year, maybe a quick word on what you're planning um, for the full year, and also in this respect, uh, with respect to the um, to the uh, own stores development. And as you push more the online business, uh, does that mean that you're planning more store closures this year? And maybe with a little view on uh, the next year's what you think will happen at your own retail business in the physical stores. And um, on the on the debt side, um, of the 2.1 billion bilateral credit line, I believe you had. Um, how much of that is drawn at this point in time? Thank you. On the first one, on the capex line, um, on the capex line, Jürgen. Uh, of course, we we reviewed every capex spend that we have, and uh, we delayed some of the retail expansion. Uh, we have delayed some of the remodeling. We're optimizing it. Uh, we definitely reviewed some of the IT projects. So, based on the guidance that we have given, you know, assume it's you know significantly below, below that guidance without you know raising a new guidance now for for capex specifically. But but we went through every line and will be significantly reduce that one. Uh, when it comes to the to the credit lines. I'm not going to give you the details what has been drawn, but uh, you can see in the in the bridge that I presented earlier, there has been 900 million has been you know drawn uh, on committed and uncommitted lines, and there has been 300 million extra financing that we have uh, you know, realized. So 1.2 billion is additional cash that we brought in in the first quarter. Um, that's as much as I can say about that. Sorry, with the uh, the own stores your own retail stores, uh, maybe met more closures this year than initially planned? That will be, a, they will evaluate the situation as, as, as we see it moving forward. So there's no doubt that in certain areas there will be store closures. I would not rule out that we'll do store openings. So we believe we can find the right retail, uh, re, right retail locations at the right price that we know is long-term appropriate for the company. I would not rule that out. But uh, right now we're looking upon it and very much depends upon what is the opening scenarios, and that will to a certain extent drive it. We have done a you know, substantial, quote-unquote, remodeling and, and cleanup of our re retail fleet in the last couple of years and have a fairly updated retail fleet. 
Very good. Thanks, guys. The next question is from the line of Warwick O'Kynes from Exane BMP Paribas. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've got two questions. Firstly, could you um, give us a sense of the of the scale of newness product launches that you've delayed and postponed as, as a result of the lockdowns? It, it doesn't sound like you've um, uh, delayed a lot so far, but just interested in your in your thoughts on that. Uh, and then secondly, on, on cost savings, um, thanks very much for the very helpful charts around uh, flexibility for 2020. C could you comment anything uh, any more about Q2, though, because the dynamics obviously are quite different in Q2, having so many stores closed. Um, it, are there differences, or, or should we um, use the pie charts that you've given us as a, as a decent guide for, for our estimates for Q2? So I will take uh, the product launches. We have made very few changes to our product launches in the past quarter and also the quarter to come, also because a lot of the product launches are related to the season. So if you want to have a summer product, there's no point in you know, delaying a summer product to a fall launch. So we have the, you know, we have the products which are time relevant and then what we have we call the evergreen products. The evergreen products will have carryover with, so that means they will last longer. It could be a black pair of Adidas trousers with white stripes on. They are not very... Uh, they're not very uh, relevant to the time. But, of course, your other products we continue to either from a relevant standpoint due to the season or simply because we're operating within an within a architecture. The arch architecture would be the 4D products where we continue to evolve and develop new products or new running series of SL20. Those we, of course, you know, continue to launch. And now we've just chosen to launch them online, and we believe it's the right way of doing it. So continue to overall launch around the calendar the evergreen products is that the black you know, training pens or the adilets, they will have a longer lifetime than maybe normally, but overall we have not had a big change in our launch calendar. Yeah, on the cost savings, uh, Warwick, um, of course, as I said, we will be below priority in the second quarter, but still there will be deleverage. And what we need to you know, balance is um, the technical measures that we are implementing without jeopardizing our future prospects. And again, we are protecting our 60,000 employees, but we, of course, we had more time to go deeper into the cost base for Q2, and that's what you will see. But uh, do not expect that we can, you know, mitigate the significant sales decline on the cost side. But it will be below prior year, both on the marketing and on the operating overheads. I would just like to just mention a point, and Ham has touched on before, with the acceleration we're seeing in e-commerce that is flowing into operating overhead. So when you see that we came from 35 to 55 and triple digit in the month of April, that is an expense that we're seeing occurring in operating overhead. Uh, so I just want to make sure that you have that as a reference in your modeling. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Warwick. Next question is from the line of Omar Saad from Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for taking my question, and, and thank you very much for the comprehensive presentation. It's very clear what your near-term and long-term uh, priorities are. Um, two questions. I wanted to know, number one, if you have a view on organized sports this fall, you know, whether it's professional level or the youth and school level. Um, you know, I think it's pretty easy to – or it's easier to think about the pro sports with testing, <laughs> getting back on field, maybe not with uh, – full stadiums, but I think that the youth sport level, it's maybe organized sports and team sports, it's harder for us to ha understand how that might play out. Um, and then my second question <clears throat> is on conversion. The comments you made in China around conversion was interested. Um, is, the on is the weaker conversion happening online as well? It doesn't sound like it. And then in the stores, do you think the conversion is weaker uh, with apparel versus footwear because there's a safety fear or trying, trying, trying products on in the dressing rooms? Are you seeing any different consumer behavior around traffic and conversion, younger consumers in China versus older? Any sort of color around that, those dynamics would be very helpful. Thanks. So on the first one, sports participation. This is a very difficult question because there's one element, which is simply regulation. What does the different countries allow you to do? And I'm not speaking, I'm speaking about the question you asked, not, not the, uh, you know, the big sporting events. So there's a regulation element of it. Um, that frankly we have to go through country by country. That's why you cannot have a generic opinion about it. The opinion we do have is that we believe there is a greater level of interest in sport, particularly you know for youth. If you've been locked up for six or eight weeks, and I have kids also, and I think all of you have, you know they go crazy uh, because they want to go out and exercise. We think that that will continue. So 
even if there is a more conservative approach to it, the likelihood that some kind of running or movement exercise is going to be allowed is very, very high, but you've really got to do it one by one. Uh, on, um, on online, uh, we believe we have, you know, there's an uh, increase in online conversion, there's a decrease in in-store conversion. And we believe the reason why there's a decrease in in-store conversion is that, you know, consumers are just trying to get back and live a normal life again and starting to see what's in the store. We think over time that will normalize. We do not report whether it's uh, by category, but w the most important part is to get traffic up, get people start feeling comfortable in the store. Uh, we do not believe, uh, and uh, I would say the following, we have not run the hypothesis that there should be a lower conversion rate for footwear versus apparel. Uh, that's not the indication. We have neither pro or con. Uh, right now we're just seeing an overall lower conversion rate, but of course, as I said, the primary interest we have is getting traffic back into our store, and the more we get that, then over time, conversion will go up again, we feel comfortable about. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Jamie Merriman from Bernstein. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks very much. Um, the first question is um, whether you could speak to any um, any learnings that you've had from uh, you know the impact of coronavirus in terms of you know either reinforcing your strategy or reshaping it beyond the digital um, uh, transformation that you talked about. You know, I'm thinking. You know, as you think about these issues like um, uh, conversion in stores in China, does that cause you to think differently about, um, you know, using an app in store to check out for consumers, for example? Um, or are there any other things that you've taken away from this that will cause a shift in how you're thinking about um, the, the use of the store? Um, and then second, uh, can you just – clarify exactly what the Q2 guidance assumes in terms of a store reopening timing for North America and Europe. Thanks. So I would say that the biggest, uh, I would say not learning, but, but uh, change within our strategic framework or underpinning our strategic framework is the acceleration of digital, whether it's how we communicate the use of apps, you know, the direct transaction within our landing page or uh, in our, on our store, uh, excuse me, uh, on our landing page or in our app, uh, ship from store is definitely becoming more and more prevalent. So a lot of uh, stores we're using, we're you know, building inventories and shipping, shipping from a, uh, I would say, a closed store. So the, the digital acceleration, along with probably the presence of sustainability, are the two most pronounced acceleration points within our current strategic framework. Um, okay. And that, that is, and we expect that also to occur across the board in other you know, countries because we are seeing it coming up and we're seeing a increased acceleration of the app, the downloads of the app, and interest of also hype apps like our Trilogy app. But when it comes to um, the, uh, do you have it? Do you have it? Yeah, the store openings. So um, I think Casper mentioned that in, in his remarks that, um, Jamie, our assumption is that we will be able to sequentially reopen our stores throughout the month of May and June and then have a largely operational store base by the end of Q2. For Europe, this means that we've actually already started to open select stores. The first 20 are open. The next 20 are going to come over the next week, and then uh, we will have to see how it continues from there. And in North America, we expect to start with first store openings in mid-May. Thank you. These are, of course, assumptions. So, and those assumptions will be impacted by local legislation. So, if it happens early, it happens early. If it happens later, it happens later. But that's based. That is our Q2 outlook is based on what we just said here. Okay. Thanks very much, Jamie. But we have time for two more questions, Stuart. Okay. The next question is from the line of Cedric Lecable from Mine First. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for taking my questions. I have two. The first one is on your marketing uh, budget uh, this year, given the interesting comments on the shift towards uh, digital. Could you help us maybe understand the kind of uh, big picture for marketing, and should we expect any volatility quarter from, from a quarter to another in marketing spent during the year? Uh, and the second question would be on the pileup of inventories, given your ordering changes, cancellations, when do you expect the kind of peak of uh, inventory build-up happen? Thank you very much. 
So when we look upon our marketing spend, as Haim indicated, a lot of our spend is closed down in, in campaigns. What you should assume is that overall the marketing spend will be um, down year over year. You didn't see that in the first quarter. You'll see in acceleration the second and the third quarter of that spend, despite the fact, despite the fact that we are taking our overall marketing spend for digital up. But you'll start seeing it in absolute terms. I actually think in terms of relative terms makes less sense because of the volatility of the you know of the of the um of the revenue lines so on actual terms year over year will be down in q two and of course we expect it to be signif- significantly down on the fu- on the full year basis under the current assumption that will continue to be impacted also in the third and the fourth quarter so our current assumption is significantly down year over year down quarter over quarter up on e commerce yeah, and on the inventory, I mean, based on our order patterns, I mean, the whole you know lockdown globally happened in mid March, and the 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 order month that we could impact it, you know, significantly still was kind of August and beyond, and of course uh, we went uh, you know a little bit you know before that as well with some of the cancellations that I talked about earlier. So it's depending on the ramp up that we did, Sebastian just described, you know, May June, uh, you should assume that June July is probably the peak of the inventory build up for us uh, during the year. Thank you. Thanks, Cedric. Let's call from the line of Anne Messier from HSBC France. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thanks again for this very useful um, uh, chart in your presentation. Uh, two questions. So, f- first of all, uh, regarding China, um, I think you commented that you expected uh, uh, you know, that region to come back to positive growth you know, during the quarter. Uh, could you maybe you know, give a bit of flavor of, of the trends that you're seeing, and, and maybe uh, um, you know, would, would that mean that you're still negative uh, currently uh, overall uh, in, in China at the moment? Uh, and second question re- regarding your guidance for Q2. Uh, first of all, uh, that triple digit um, you know, million, that does it mean between 100 and, and 200 million? Uh, what's the, the gross margin um, sort of uh, guidance? Is it um, a decline which would be more severe than in Q1 or, or lower? Uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. So, Antoine, thank you very much for your question. Let me clarify the China situation. We believe that by the end of the quarter, will be on or above previous year, but that means for the quarter, China will be below. We expect our online sales to be substantially above and our own retail sales to be substantially above. We still expect the wholesale to be, you know, the franchise to be low, to clarify that. So you should look upon the ramp of it, and it's a ramp by the end of it. For the guidance of the second quarter, as we said, that pretty much the world, with two countries' exception, has been closed for April. So you should make the you know, assumption that very little business outside or no no business outside digital business has been made in all regions besides korea and uh, and china and that means that we expect a you know 40 percent decline versus the 20. we are breaking even at the 20 and then i have to unfortunately say you have to make your own assumptions but it is in the triple digit millions uh, for what we're seeing so that is you know that is the best guidance we can give you at this stage for the second quarter but right now uh, we will be have, we are exposed to the same as everybody else, and that's a close down month of April. And of course, the opening up, as the previous question was asking, is is the key. When is you know when are countries opening up, which are legally driven, and what is the ramp in the countries? And you can see the ramp which we explained to you about in China. Maybe before we completely close, uh, let me just make the following remarks. While it's a very painful process to go through because we operate an industry when a store closes, you don't sell anything but online. That is very clearly, uh, you know, impacted our business, as you can see. The reverse also goes when the store opens up, we can start trading again. So we have a more profound impact. We believe we have one that's probably of a shorter duration than others. We believe that, as I said, that the global trends for the sporting goods industry remain unchanged or even improved in the medium term. Of course, not in the short term, because that's why we're sitting and where we're sitting. But the global trends towards, you know, health, towards, you know, uh, sport, towards living a more casual lifestyle with having millions of people working from home has been very clearly substantiated through, quote-unquote, Adilet, you know, to change toward a digital setup and a D2C model with the implication it has from our gross margin and also operating overhead uh, is dramatically accelerated. So while we see 2020 being a very painful year, and I'm certain you would do the same, we do believe that the underlying trends are equally good or even better 
in the medium term. We have to get to the medium term, and that's what we're getting ourselves through. We will take the right decisions in the company when it comes to cost, but I also want to say a lot of the assets that will come on the market will might come on the market at a different price in the second and the third quarter because of demand supply, and we want to make certain that attractive sports assets that could be on the market at a lower price point than normal, that we don't get ourselves out of that market and be jeopardized or be you know punished for that in the next five years to come. With this, both Ham, you know, Sebastian, and I look forward to speaking to you over the next weeks and months to explain to you how we see the business. And I can assure you that should we see deviation, positive as negative, we will keep you updated appropriately. Thanks very much, Kasper. Thanks very much also to Harm. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our Q1 2020 results conference call. Our next reporting date will be August the 6th for our Q2 results. If you still have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Adrian Christoph or myself. I guess you know how to track us down. And with that, I would like to thank you for your participation. Bye-bye. And most importantly, stay safe. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, the conference is now concluded, and you may disconnect your telephone. Thank you for joining, and have a pleasant day. Goodbye.